Glenn Maxwell thinks she's the victim. <laughs> Has she forgotten the criminal charges she's facing for allegedly grooming and abusing children for Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> and did I hear the Rust movie armorer correctly? Alec Baldwin may have been intentionally handed a loaded weapon. Well, thanks for joining Profiling Evil for this quick review of some of the crazy stories circulating this week. Now, before we get started, I want to take a moment and ask you to hit that like and the subscribe button. Ring the bell. That way, you'll get all of our notifications. You'll receive alerts on our new releases. Now, according to complaints from her attorney, a handcuffed and shackled Galen Maxwell was forced to crawl on her hands and knees as she climbed into a prison van that was taking her to a pretrial hearing on federal charges of crimes of enticing minors and sex trafficking of underage girls. I'm going to say that again. Crimes of enticing minors and sex trafficking of underage girls. Well, Maxwell's attorneys filed a series of motions regarding the case, but Judge Allison Nathan rejected them. In fact, the judge cautioned the defense about trying to argue that the charges were politically motivated, and she made it really clear that the real victims in this case are going to be allowed to testify using pseudonyms, which Maxwell's team had opposed. Now, Maxwell did find some success with one motion that said that the prosecution couldn't introduce evidence into the trial showing that the British socialite had arranged for massages for women who were over the age of consent. Now, keep in mind, Maxwell's attorneys unsuccessfully requested the court to ban the use of words such as victim or minor during the trial. Can you believe this even was a question? The judge swiftly ruled that their request was unnecessary and impractical. Now, while Maxwell argues that she's being mistreated in jail, but victimized by the system and being unfairly prosecuted, we need to remember that she allegedly victimized children, underage girls that she groomed and provided to pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Now, you might remember my videos where I discussed Gillen Maxwell, the grooming tactics, and the relationship that existed between Maxwell and now deceased predator Jeffrey Epstein. I hope you'll go back and watch those if you didn't. In there, I think we explore some things that are really important to understand, and they may be things that you'll want to share with people that you love. Now, as jury selection begins next week, we're going to see a lot of finagling in the courtroom as the prosecution and the defense look for the perfect juror. Now, opening statements in this trial are scheduled to begin on November 29th, but the trial is expected to last clear into the first week of January. I mean, holy cow, this is going to be a month-long with a little bit of carryover, I guess because of the holidays, we'll lose some days there. Since we're talking court cases, did you catch the irresponsible actions of the juror in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial? He made this offhanded comment about Rittenhouse's victim, Jacob Blake, to a correctional officer that was escorting him to his vehicle. According to Judge Bruce Schroeder, the juror asked the officer jokingly, quote, why did it take seven shots to shoot Jacob Blake? Close quote. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Uh, let's take just a moment and listen to the courtroom proceedings as the judge questions and then rules on this terribly. I, the reason I asked you to come down was um, there was a... Uh, I was told that uh, while you were being escorted to the car uh, the other day that you uh, began to tell a joke um, about the shooting of Jacob Blake and I wanted to see if is that accurate or not and not it is okay um, uh, are you comfortable repeating what the joke was or do you want to just leave it alone 
I, I'm going to tell you that um, uh, I, I spoke about, um, well, I guess I'll hear from Mr. Uh, Do you want to finish what you were saying? I will tell you, I will tell you that um, I've talked quite a bit about public confidence in the outcome of the trial, and regardless of whether uh, the uh, issue is as grave as you presented it in terms of inner feelings, uh, it is clear that the appearance of bias is present, and it would seriously undermine the, the uh, outcome of the case. All right, I think uh, the best thing under the circumstances, I'm gonna dismiss you from the jury, sir. I really appreciate the response of the court officers in this situation, and I echo their recommendation to immediately dismiss this juror. You heard the judge admonish him in that video. There's absolutely no place for this kind of behavior or that kind of a personality on a jury, especially one that's weighing testimony in a homicide trial. Kudos to the judge for swiftly removing him from the panel, which will ultimately be narrowed down from the current 19 members to 12 people who will decide Rittenhouse's fate. We're going to continue to watch this one, and I hope you will too. Now, here's a story that has really baffled me, and it surrounds the accidental shooting death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins by actor-producer Alec Baldwin. Either Russ Movie Armorer Hannah Gutierrez Reed or her attorneys are alleging that somebody may have put a loaded round into a box of blanks on the movie set. Now, I tipped my hand early on that I wondered if a disgruntled member of the film crew may have done something trying to, to maybe prove a point that turned disastrous. But the question I have right now is, was this really a comment made by Gutierrez Reed, or, or did the armorer's attorneys, Jason Bowles and Robert Gorant, speak their own opinion when they told NBC News that they believe someone may have intentionally placed a live round in the box of dummy rounds? This is so important that I want to read their words with quotation marks. Bowles is speaking, and he says, quote, how did a live round get on set? And who put that live round on the set? There was a box of dummy rounds labeled dummy. We don't know whether the live round came from that box. We're assuming somebody put the live round in that box. Close quote. Either way, I'm confused by what's gained by sharing this absurd comment. I mean, in my opinion, the facts are that a live, loaded bullet ended up in the 1880 replica Peacemaker revolver that Alex Baldwin was holding, the weapon that he pulled the trigger on, killing Hutchins and wounding director Joel Sousa. Why is this noise being created when the lingering question continues to be, why wasn't the weapon inspected before it was fired? Now, we know, based on testimony thus far, that the gun was handed to the assistant director by the armorer. Here's my question. Did the armorer, the same person, clear that weapon? Apparently not. We know that the assistant director handed the loaded weapon to Alec Baldwin, declaring it was cold. Did he clear the weapon personally before handing it over and making this definitive statement? But apparently not. And we know, we know that Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger. Did Alec Baldwin clear the weapon? Uh, apparently not. So why on earth are we bringing up this question? I am so troubled by this that I thought I might take a moment and instruct you a little bit on live 45 caliber rounds and blank 45 caliber rounds, just so that you can visualize what they should have visualized themselves. Now, anyone who has ever trained with weapons, who, who attended hunter safety classes, or has spent any time on a range or with firearms knows that every weapon is always, always loaded. 
you don't point the weapon at something you don't intend on shooting, and a movie set is no exception. The 45 long Colt bullet is usually a 250 grain lead round nose projectile. You can see it here in this image as I'm talking. It is one and a half inches long and it travels at a speed of about 450 feet per second. That means that it can cover one and a half American sized football fields in one second. Now, it was developed back in the 1800s, the latter part of the 1800s, and while it is slow by bullet comparison, it is incredibly powerful. Now, to highlight how slow this bullet really travels, again, remember 450 feet per second, compare that to the weapons shot today by our members of the military. The M4 carbine, for instance, that bullet travels at 2,900 feet per second. <laughs> That's six times faster. Now, think of the bullet that you've been looking at while I describe this 45 Colt uh, blank. The blank is much shorter. Look at this. It, it doesn't have a projectile. Instead, it has a brass crimped top. The, the shell casing is actually crimped at the top to hold the gunpowder in. It, it would be incredibly difficult to confuse the two types of rounds. It's shorter, lighter, and again, the top's crimped. Now, to be fair, the movie industry may have used some simulated bullets that don't have a firing pin or gunpowder in them just to have this visual purpose, such as showing the actor loading the weapon. I hope this helps you remain focused on what I think is really important in this case. And I'd like to know your thoughts on what I've shared and whether you think it's possible that a disgruntled film crew member could have planted a live round to prove a point about alleged concerns over movie set safety. But either way, does it change the fact that three different people handled that weapon? Three different people had an opportunity to clear that weapon, the same weapon that killed Helena Hutchins and wounded Sousa. Apparently, none of them did. So what do you think? I mean, I'm going to be watching for your comments below on this. And now, as we wrap up the week, I want to remind you all to watch the Dennis Wustenhoff family on the Dr. Phil show this coming week. Detective Wustenhoff was murdered in front of his home 30 years ago. And there are big developments this week that are, that are going to focus a new light on his unsolved murder case, I believe. The news... A new district attorney, challenger Ray Tierney, defeated incumbent Tim Seney for the Suffolk County lead prosecutor's job. It's my hope that Tierney will intensify the focus and the investigation into this decades-old homicide. I also hope that Dennis's family will finally see progress in their father's senseless, unsolved murder. Again, I want to shout out my buddy, Ray Kelly, a former partner to Detective Wustenhoff. He brought this case to my attention, and we've since talked to him and, and the family on Profiling Evil. I hope you'll go back and watch those shows. But most importantly, watch the Dr. Phil show this coming week. Well, that's all for this week, and I hope you found it to be interesting and educational. Hey, if you're looking for holiday gift ideas, we got a special running on my two books, Deceived, an Investigative Memoir of the Zion Society Cult, and She Knew No Fear. I hope you'll check them out, and please take a moment, hit the like and the subscribe button so you get all of our notifications. Hey, folks, thanks again for supporting Profiling Evil, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.